Great, so welcome uh, to the latest presentation in the Festival of Coins. Today we're joined by Jesse Craft, who's a curator at the American Numismatic Society. And we're really excited to be able to, to present a live launch of a new website that Jesse's been working on. That's the Medelic Art Company website. Um, so over to you, Jesse, and we're really interested to hear more about the project. Great. Hello, Jesse Craft. I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right. So this is the Medallic Art Company Archives website. Uh, just a little bit of a background. Uh, the Medallic Art Company is one of the uh, oldest, or was one of the oldest um, mints, private mints in the United States. Uh, it, it lasted from 1903, 1907-ish to uh, 2013. Uh, while they weren't necessarily, you know, absolutely the oldest, they were uh, arguably one of the most important. Uh, they made many, many medals for, for thousands of different clients, uh, even such thing as the, the Peabody Awards, um, uh, and so on. Um, uh, in 2018, uh, the archives of the Medallic Art Company went to public auction uh, after they went bankrupt and the American Numismatic Society purchased them. Um, and it ranged in content uh, from a near complete collection of um, metals that they produced throughout their entire uh, existence, as well as uh, digital archives, a lot of paper archives, binders, books that they used in-house during the production process, um, uh, dyes, dye shells, galvanos, um, literally hundreds of tons of material um, that were still really in the process of, uh, of trying to organize and catalog. Uh, so this website I made as not necessarily uh, a short-term website. We do want to use it for a few years, but kind of just to uh, uh, allow people to have some sort of insight into what the collection has. And it's really a blog. Uh, so uh, there's content that I posted on there, and then there's going to be, there is a blog that uh, I will be periodically updating as we process the archives as well. So this is the landing page. Um, Medallic Archive Company uh, Archives held by the American Numismatic Society. This is the uh, Medallic Art Company logo and then the American Numismatic Society logo. Uh, I have the website into four main sections. The first is actually the Mako Specimen Archive itself. I'll click that. And uh, these are actually the um, the documents that Mako used in order to uh, catalog the uh, collection as they, they went through it. Dick Johnson in the 60s and the 70s made this catalog and, um, and then it just grew from there. Um, there are many, many errors that I've found in the, the uh, catalog as I've been going through it piece by piece. Uh, but we still decided to kind of post this because it's kind of cool to see what Mako used uh, in-house. Even up here, you can see Specimen Image Archive, proprietary and confidential, not for distribution. That was Mako's policy. Now we own it, and we kind of just wanted to, to let it out there because it's going to take us probably a couple years before we have a complete and uh, hopefully error-free catalog that we will be uh, able to post um, and, it, and it won't be in this format necessarily either. As you can see, there are lots of different, uh, um, you know, things that we don't need. Like this is the, the uh, kind of the code for the, the image. You know, we won't have that. And some of the, the information is wrong. Um, also, things like obverse and reverse aren't next to each other, which can cause some sort of confusion as you're going through it. So simple things like that we plan to, to update uh, into a, a, a more modern um, and error-free catalog in due time. Uh, but some things that you are able to do with this now is uh, if you have a Mako metal, which uh, you know some of them aren't necessarily that rare, and the fact that they made more than 15,000 medals um, throughout their career, uh, 
you know, chances are that you can that you can come across a metal by Mako relatively easy for a relatively inexpensive uh, amount, uh, but at the same time not know what it is just because there are so many made for so many purposes. So we wanted to kind of just release this catalog uh, as is and allow people to kind of have fun with it because it is kind of a fun uh, little thing to go through. They're uh, cataloged uh, separated by decade. So here's the first decade. They didn't make too many, but as time went on, uh, the, the catalogs just got more and more intense. And, um, and even actually by the uh, 60s, they actually had to catalog or break them up into five years, half decades instead of full decades, just because they were getting way too long. But as you can see, I mean, um, you know, there's just a whole a plethora of different metals that, that Mako made. And again, you could very easily come across one and have no idea what it is, um, uh, when it was made or anything like that. So this catalog will, will give you at least the bare minimal uh, information that, that you might be looking for, including the name of the metal, uh, who uh, the client that commissioned it, uh, where that client was located, uh, the artist that sculpted the metal, and also um, different sizes of the metal, because some metals weren't only in one size, but you can have uh, the same metal in various sizes, as well as uh, different um, compositions as well. Uh, so this is uh, kind of, you know, a fun little insight that, that we're hoping people will play around with. And if, by all means, if you come across an error, let me know and I can update it. Um, because there are many of them in here and it is an awfully long catalog to, for one person to, to have to go through. So I'm kind of hoping that the collector community will, will help out with that. Unfortunately, there were two uh, little sections, 2000 to 2004, and then 2010 to 13 that we didn't get the PDFs for. Um, I do have them printed out. So if you do come across to make a metal that for, are from either of those little uh, sections, um, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. Um, I'm sure we can post my email in the description of this uh, video, and uh, I'll be more than happy to, to help you out with that. Uh, another section that I created um, kind of for eye candy was is for images, different historical images of Mako. I have two different sections. One is actually of the production process itself. So here you can see the James H. Hyde medallion on the Jean Vier reduction machine. Right here is the die shell and it's tracing it and engraving it into the die. And this is the actual die that would then strike metals. You can see the same to the right is the obverse of the metal being uh, reduced. And then over here is the reverse of the metal being reduced. Right here is the, um, the metal itself. You can see the bust is right there. And then the four smaller busts being reduced over here. So this is some of the um, digital archives that, rec that we've received along with the, uh, with the Mako archives. And I kind of just found all these uh, images in a, in a unmarked folder, had a lot of fun with them, kind of go through them and trying to figure out what the different metals are because they weren't marked as such. So I had to use the catalog that I just showed you to kind of find out what these were uh, just based off the image. It's the 1951 World Metallurgical Congress that was held in Detroit. And there's the die shell, something's happening with that. Here's the finished die, it's being taken out. I think it was just annealed, which means it was hardened. Um, here's a finished metal, metal um, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the coating being put on it towards the end. And then this metal actually has uh, a mounting bar in the reverse. And here's one of the Mako workers uh, putting the mounting bar on. You can see the finished metal here. Right there, and here's the mounting bar that he's soldering on. So that was kind of fun to go through. Uh, World War II campaign medals, Mako made, uh, in, in addition to uh, like large round bronze medals that were used to, Mako made a lot of uh, war decorations uh, for the uh, United States military. Um, you know, pretty much any time there was a war that the United States was involved with, if you go through the Mako catalog, you can inevitably, inevitably see a bunch of war decorations that they made as well. 
and they are kind of being sorted and then packed for distribution. And I did account, and there's literally, uh, you know, upwards of 100,000 uh, metals right here. So they didn't make them in, in small numbers. So they're definitely out there for collectors. And then here's a series of photos that I, they don't necessarily show the metal, so I couldn't positively identify the, the picture with a metal uh, in that production process, but uh, a bunch that are just kind of uh, cool. Here's an employee uh, making blank planchets uh, for metals being struck. Uh, some more of the production process. Here's brokers kind of sorting them out. Uh, and then distribution. So this kind of gives you uh, an insight into to how Mako, um, uh, you know, operated in, in the mid 50s, in the mid 20th century. I go back one, I have a second set of photos. Uh, these are uh, recipients of Mako medals. Um, and this is really where kind of uh, a lot of Mako medals really entered into American society was through different uh, achievements um, and things like that. So this is Carl Meyer, who won the American Legion School Award, as well as the pin that's, uh, that's pinned to him. That was, these are, um, you know, both a part of that award. Uh, Carl was, was born in Germany, but his parents had passed away, and then he was raised by an uncle in San Francisco. Um, and it said in, uh, on the back, there was a little piece of paper that he said that he hoped to join the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis. Here is um, uh, Nino Martini, who is a uh, famous tenor on the radio um, in the 1930s, and he's uh, in the process of winning the CBS Guest Medallion Award. Uh, Martini was actually the first radio artist uh, to be signed uh, by a leading uh, role for the, the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City. Here's uh, Catherine Cornell, who was awarded the Delia Austrian uh, Medal for Distinguished Performance in 1935 for her uh, work in Romeo and Juliet. Um, uh, uh, this was at the uh, Central Park Casino, the 25th anniversary for the Drama League. Uh, for anyone of these individuals that are kind of more well known, uh, just as a little side note, I was able to actually link them uh, to their Wikipedia page, just to give you a little bit more insight. So if you see a name that is, uh, that has a link that, you know, their names are highlighted, uh, you're able to click them and go to a Wikipedia page to learn more about that individual. That wasn't necessarily the case with everyone. For instance, Carl Meyer up here, he didn't uh, necessarily become well known enough in history to warrant his own Wikipedia page. So I, I wasn't able to link that to any but Nino Martini as well, famous tenor. Go down, uh, here we have Malvina Hoffman, who is a famous sculptress uh, throughout the 30s and 40s, and she is in the process of winning the American Women's Association Medallion, um, and Pearl S. Buck uh, is awarding it to her. So. Uh, here we have uh, Gifford Pinchot, who is the Pennsylvania um, governor, as well as a very famous um, nature conservator in the United States. Uh, this is grandson. Uh, Dr. Petrus uh, Dubai uh, over here uh, is winning the, the Gregor P. Mendel medal. And very famous one, uh, Amelia Earhart being awarded the National Geographic Society a uh, special gold medal by President Herbert Hoover in 1932. Lester Goldsmith winning the George Malice Melville or George Wallace Melville medal in 1939. And lastly, Harold E. Stesson, uh, who's the governor of Minnesota on the right, um, winning the Parents Magazine medal for his uh, outstanding service to children. Um, it's being uh, awarded by pub publisher uh, George Hecht, and this person right here is Linda Casson, who is the quote unquote little magazine cover girl during that period. So these are really examples of, of different 
Mako medals that were, you know, kind of entering Amer American society in the way that they were intended to be uh, as awards uh, for recognition of, of different achievements. So this is really kind of a, a special little page for me. And a lot of these actually didn't, um, while I was going through these photos, which are again, were in a in kind of an unmarked folder in the Mako digital archives. I kind of had to do a little bit more re research using the catalog that I'd already shown you and kind of figure out what medal uh, the individual was, was winning at the time and who the people were. So that, that was a, another fun little project. If we go down, I can show you the next part, which are different essays that I've written. This is kind of incomplete. I haven't quite finished this. I want to add a few more uh, essays, but I have one, you know, what are medals? Uh, you know, kind of the sort of thing, you know, we know it when we see it, but, uh, you know, they, there is a distinct group of, you know, subsection of numismatics that, that constitute medals. And uh, within that, um, you know, there's actually quite a different, uh, uh, quite a few different types of medals that, that constitute a medal. Like here's an art medal, which is just for pure sake of art. Uh, I mean, there's no real, um, you know, a lot of these weren't necessarily awarded as decorations or awards or anything like that, but simply for uh, a means for an artist to express him or herself. Here's society medals. Um, this is the Edward T. Newell Presidential Medal for the New York Numismatic Club. Um, uh, every president of the New York Numismatic Club gets their portrait on the obverse of one of these medals. That's a tradition that carries on to today and has since 1908. Um, so these are society medals, you know, kind of uh, different ways that medals are, are uh, dispersed as well. Um, portrait medals are, are similar to art medals, except they're usually commissioned by a person. Um, and it's, uh, you know, they're not awarded in any given way. Uh, the artist usually has uh, pretty strict guidelines that they have to follow. Um, you know, here's Audrey and Noel, uh, the obverse and the reverse of the coin or of the medals. Um, and most likely uh, their parents commissioned it just to kind of celebrate the lives of, of these children. Here are uh, uh, decorations that I was telling you about these, um, are usually given for, um, many of them are given for military reasons, um, but also, you know, sports accomplishments, uh, pretty much, um, you know, lots of different types of accomplishments can be awarded uh, by decoration that usually gets pinned uh, on one's shirt or jacket, uh, as opposed to the medals that I was showing you earlier uh, with the recipients that are uh, the traditional, uh, you know, larger round bronze medals. And some other, uh, I didn't put photographs for all of them, but commemorative medals, uh, souvenir medals that if you go, you know, to an exhibition or, or a fair or something like that, you can find them there. Uh, religious medals, uh, orders, and then table medals are really the, the ones that are kind of too large um, to, to be um, held in a, in a traditional way. So a lot of them are, are placed into uh, wooden stands and stuff like that and are, um, uh, displayed on a table. Medallic production process. Um, I, if you haven't watched The Metal Maker, it's an absolutely incredible movie. Uh, it's a half hour long. Um, it uh, was made in 1929 and it shows Lara Garden Fraser creating the National Sculpture Society Special Medal of Honor. Uh, I'm not going to play it in, in its entirety here, but please do watch it. Uh, and it really is an incredible um, movie that really documents from uh, how metal was made from a blank canvas, uh, you know, through the whole artist pro um, artistic process. And then even um, after uh, the artist is done with it, uh, what Mako were a similar um, manufacturing uh, company would do with it and this metal was actually made by Mako so you get to see a uh, video of Mako actually making the metal in 1929. Uh, this, met or this video is actually thought to be lost for several decades 
um, and then it was rediscovered in the in the late 1990s. And then uh, um, Elizabeth Jones, who is the former chief engraver of the United States Mint, kind of did a voiceover to it. Um, and then the American Numismatic Society uh, helped uh, publish it and reproduce it. And I have a, a not necessarily lengthy, but uh, a little bit more detailed um, uh, description of, of how metals were made uh, by Mako in particular. Um, uh, I, for uh, research for this, I used a, an article that was published in the Numismatist, um, uh, the publication of the American Numismatic Association. Uh, it was published in 1978, this, uh, an article by Edward R. Grove who was a private uh, sculptor, as well as he was also a mint engraver for a short time in the early 1960s. And he got into pretty uh, good detail on, on his techniques of the metal making process. And then also, since he had firsthand knowledge of dealing with the Metallic Art Company, he was able to give rather specific uh, uh, production processes by them as well. So that was, uh, if you're interested at all, and how metals are made. Uh, this is really the section for you. I have a brief um, kind of leading up to uh, the Metallic Art Company, uh, metals in the United States before World War I. Uh, Mako kind of started just before that. So this is, uh, you know, um, just kind of like a brief history on, on metals uh, before Mako and, and what they represented. Uh, the Libertas Americana medal is one of the most famous and a lot of United States coins were um, inevitably uh, designed after this, the, the Liberty Cap cents and the flowing hair dollar and everything else. Um, again, not gonna necessarily read all of it, but kind of just give you a, a brief um, introduction to it, just to, to kind of let you go back and, and read it on your own. Mint metals. Um, and starts to discuss uh, kind of the, um, the artistic turn uh, right around in the 1890s and 1900s uh, when um, James Earl Frazier, uh, Augustus St. Gaudens, Victor David Brenner uh, started to get uh, into the medallic making process, uh, which really revolutionized. Um, how metals were made and the artistic quality of them. A very famous uh, metal by James Earl Fraser um, that portrays Augusta St. Gaudens. And this here is uh, actually made by um, John Davison's and Sons uh, Philadelphia, but it shows the Jean Vier reduction machine. Um, actually two different uh, kind of uh, reduction machines, but the, the obverse one is the one that is really uh, integral to um, the metallic making process. And back to essays, I have one more that is the history of Mako, kind of the early years. Um, I'm working on kind of subsequent years right now that I just uh, haven't quite finished yet and haven't been able to upload, but eventually I'm gonna have similar um, pages devoted to uh, other sections of uh, history of, of Mako. And then eventually, um, you know, I wanna uh, write a, a much larger book on the history of Mako. This is actually the very first uh, uh, set of dyes that Mako made um, it was designed by Augustus St. Gaudens, um, and he commissioned Mako to reduce the dyes. Interestingly enough, uh, Mako actually didn't actually strike any metals uh, for the first about 15 years of their existence. They were only a dye reduction company. Um, this is another one that they uh, reduced in 1909, uh, Jules Edward Ronay. Uh, um, this was the first me uh, Mako metal to include the Mako name. You can see it right here. It's actually in the dyes. Uh, in subsequent metals, they kind of counter struck the metals on the edge, usually on the bottom edge uh, with Metallic Art Company and um, whatever location uh, they were at the time. Most of their 
existence. They were in New York, and then in the 70s, they moved to Connecticut, and then in the 80s to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and then uh, they moved to uh, Nevada, and that's where they ended up, was in Nevada. This was the first metal produced uh, by the Vile brothers, who you know were the founders of Mako. Um, uh, but when they first founded the company, they were actually kind of under the auspices of a different company that they worked for at the time. Uh, and there was kind of some legal trouble that they had, uh, but then they were finally able to purchase the name and purchase the equipment. And this is the first one that they produced uh, as the Medallic Art Company and as the sole owners in 1910. And this is um, Henry Vile. Uh, Felix Weil on the right, and then Clyde Trees. And Clyde Trees is really, um, he was key on uh, making the Medallic Art Company grow in 1919 and 1920 and, and uh, beyond that. And uh, without them, or without Clyde Trees, Mako probably would still never have struck any medals as the Weil brothers were kind of intent on um, maintaining just a dye reduction company and working uh, with their artist friends where Clyde Trees really expanded on that and started to get commissions from outside sources uh, and really, you know, is, is the person who made uh, Mako into uh, one of the more important um, uh, medallic art companies uh, in the United States. And I have one more little section, uh, the future of Mako. I don't think there are any images in here yet. Oh, there are, uh, I'll get to that. Um, but the future of Mako kind of just outlines what we, the American Numismatic Society, wants to do with this massive, massive collection that we purchased. Um, first and foremost, like I said before, we want to update the catalog. Um, there are some missing pieces in there, so add missing pieces. Um, get rid of any errors and stuff like that. Uh, we want to make a website that focuses um, on Mako and American society, um, which is kind of uh, a direction that not a lot of um, numismatic publications take uh, per se. A lot of them, especially when it comes to the Mandalic arts, a lot of people kind of focus on the artists. Uh, um, while we still do want to focus on that, um, we also feel that the clients, there's a very long list of clients that we have that kind of sum up all of American society uh, in the United States, um, as well as uh, the recipients. Uh, a lot of these medals um, are highly prized, uh, both now and when they were first issued. Um, some of them, uh, we have been already been able to kind of locate lists of winners of uh, these different metals. And um, like I've said a few times, um, when uh, people have won or been awarded a Mako medal, that's kind of like when the piece of art was able to enter American society. And that's a key point, um, is, is kind of key in, in the metal and the medallic art history um, and the history of the specific metals. So. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I added uh, so many pictures of people actually being awarded the medal because really it's just important um, uh, kind of instant um, snapshot uh, of, of that happening. Um, I do have, um, uh, I kind of went through a small selection of medals and kind of updated them to give um, a brief snapshot of what a finished catalog entry might look like. Um, given that I made this website on WordPress um, and the finished uh, website might not be on WordPress, it probably won't have this exact layout. But um, if you remember the catalog, there was uh, just small pictures and uh, just little bits of information. So we kind of wanted to expand on that. Um, a little bit, uh, you know, actually catalog them and give the typology, um, uh, you know, type out the legends. Again, if there is a Wikipedia page, 
uh, for any of the people, I was able to put a link to that. Um, give, uh, provide what's uh, listed on the edge. Um, compositions, diameters, thicknesses, and weights. And then also um, the artist and, and the client that, uh, that made the metal possible. So I did that with, um, I think, nine different ones. Uh, here is uh, what a series would look like. So pretty much the same, but then when you get to the bottom, um, you kind of see that this metal is part of a larger series and I put links to the different series, uh, to the different metals that are in the series. And I want to show this one too. It doesn't have a traditional die number because they didn't actually make dies um, in it or out of them. Um, but this is the, the Galvano for the Gallant Ship um, Award. The full name is the Merchant Marine Gallant Ship Citation. And if it, this wasn't actually awarded to people, but it awarded to entire ships. Um, it started out in World War II as an executive order by President Roosevelt. Um, and it can and and ships still win it uh, to the present day, uh, or earn it, I should say, to the present day. And if you know an entire ship did something kind of heroic, uh, they would get. Um, a, a, it's this is twenty and three quarters, uh, and it wasn't reduced to a die, so they would get this you know larger than uh, two feet or almost a whole meter. Um, plaque award it and uh, kind of put somewhere in a special place inside the ship. Um, have the artist, uh, the client was the United States government, gave a little brief history about it. But then here I have a list of all the different ships that were awarded this medal um, throughout the, the history. And if the ship has, again, a Wikipedia page, I was able to link to that. Not all of them do, but it's kind of interesting. Lastly, I have a frequently asked questions. Um, these are the three questions I get asked the most. Uh, what's in the archives? Um, you know, I, I pretty much said that, a near complete reference collection of all the medals, um, business records, uh, in-house histories, uh, galvanos, dyes, everything, photographs, correspondence, uh, I always get asked, can you tell me about this medal and get sent um, an email uh, image and I pretty much just go through the catalog and find the medal and um, tell them, you know, what brief history I can tell uh, them about from the catalog and now with the catalog online, hopefully that'll circumvent this question and then also I get this question a lot, you know, I'm, I'm a representative of X company and my company has utilized Mako's services in the past to have metal struck. And I always get asked if I have the dyes for them. Um, we, uh, the American Numismatic Society, actually, um, while we bought the entirety of the archives, a lot of the dyes are still active. Uh, so people do still want to get metals struck from them. And for the active section of the Medallic Art Company, uh, I have here that Metalcraft Mint Incorporated, who uh, are just outside of Green Bay, Wisconsin. They actually uh, are still uh, producing Mako metals under uh, the name, um, I think it's just Medallic uh, Art Metals uh, is what they go by now. Um, but so if you have any questions about any active dyes or anything like that, uh, you should contact uh, Metalcraft Mint Incorporated because they are still kind of carrying on the, the Mako tradition um, to this day. And that, in a nutshell, is basically the, the new uh, Medallic Art Company Archives website. That's brilliant. Thank you, Jesse. That's really interesting. Um, one of the things that impresses me is, as you say, the way it's kind of put everything in context. So it's not just the study of the medals themselves, it's putting them in context of kind of social history. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, as, uh, you know, as a research institution, we felt that was, you know, important uh, to kind of have that, um, you know, context and everything mm -hmm. and not just, you know, provide a, um, 
you know, essentially just provide a, a list of, of metals, you know, uh, we want to actually do something with this because we really do feel that it, it does capture a really uh, interesting uh, section of United States history throughout the whole 20th century and, and into the yeah. 21st even. So, and that was, that was very important for us to kind of, to, um, yeah, to include that. Excellent. So around 15,000 medals, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So how many do you think you can kind of cover in the website in the future? We're going to do all of them. Yeah. Really? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 I've been going through the medals um, one by one and just kind of getting the uh, the basic components of them, you know, the, the weight, the, the uh, composition, the diameter and the thickness. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's taken me several months. And I started in 1907 with the first medal that's in the catalog and I'm up to 1985 right now. Wow. So, yeah, so... Uh, it's a slow process. I, you know, of course I can't only concentrate on that, um, you know, but uh, yeah, that in itself is time consuming. Uh, one of the things that we did also get with the archives were um, uh, digital files of each of the photographs. So all the little photographs that you saw in the catalog, we do mm -hmm. have larger ones of those, um, okay. but a lot of them were struck in 2010 uh, or before. Um, you know, that's when the photograph was taken. So they're not the best quality anymore. Um, you know, and, and, uh, like JPEGs degrade over time and stuff like that, the more you open them. Uh, so we also eventually want to re-photograph all of the metals as well, which is going to take, you know, we're going to have to hire a, a photography assistant for that and everything. So yeah, yeah. It's not, yeah. So unfortunately, when you think of one new thing that you want to do with the metals, uh, you have to do it 15,000 times. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so even, you know, even when you're halfway through and you're, th and you're like, oh, I should do this, then you have to go back and, and just start all the way over. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. one thing we want to do before we, you know, make one final pass through the entire collection is kind of make sure we have all the bases covered and know exactly what we want to do with, with it before we start again. Yeah, because I've started over a few times with you know different little things, and and then just you know it take me a few weeks just to catch up to the point to where I was because I would have to do it you know a couple thousand yeah. times. But yeah, okay. So fifteen thousand medals. Have yes. you have you got a favorite? Um, it's really tough. Uh, I I really like. This one is kind of interesting. Um, let me share my screen again. Hmm. Um, zoom, share screen. I like this one here that I have, and I do have an image of it in images. No, it's not in images, it was in essays. What are metals? Here's the full one right here. Um, it's kind of interesting and this is like an underwater scene and the thing that I really like about it is that most of the metals have this kind of neutral bronze finish uh, you know you can see all of them essentially have that same kind of bronze finish but the finish on this with the the green patina is really kind of eye-catching and right when I saw it, it it just like you know kind of uh, you know, we have them all on trays right now, and they kind of just lit up the tray, and it, it immediately yeah. stuck out. Um, um, you know, there's some other things, uh, like the Peabody Award is kind of cool, just because it's so well-known. Uh, mm -hmm. The Pulitzer Prize, they struck the Pulitzer Prize, it's extremely well-known. Um, yeah. So kind of seeing those, um, you know, the, the kind of, uh, you know, collection example that Mako had of those is, is kind of exciting because a lot of the things on the edge um, that they struck in there, you know, countersunk into the edge on those specific examples are not on uh, the pieces that were released because they, you know, had little uh, hints or clues about the production process itself. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. They're, they're not, well, you know, the face, both the obverse and the reverse will look pretty much exactly the same. You know, there's little hints on the production process on the edge of all of these metals that aren't on, on metals that you would find in, uh, you know, otherwise. Okay. And would you say, um, are there any metals that are, you know, really historically significant? 
I, I think that the, the culture is probably very, you know, historically significant. Also, some of the Lincoln medals that were produced for the uh, centennial of his birth in 1909, uh, they were some of the first ones uh, made by Mako. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, historically have, have you know, kind of uh, held their weight as far as, um, you know, being important medals that commemorate that, that uh, the centennial. Yeah, excellent. So are there any medals in the, in the archives that are unique to the archive? Um, there is one uh, that kind of uh, comes to mind pretty immediately. Apparently in the early 2000s, Bill Gates actually had a portrait medal uh, commissioned by Mako with his bust on the obverse and his son's bust on the reverse. And while it's not quite unique, uh, he only had two struck, one for him and one for his son. And then, of course, a third one was struck for the, for the archives. Okay. Um, so, you know, not quite unique, but, you know, pretty darn close to it. Yeah. And, you know, everyone knows Bill Gates. So it's, you know, not a nobody name. So it's, that was a really cool one to come across. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, in addition to all the, the medals themselves, we have like the dyes, the, the larger galvanos and stuff like that. And all, all of those are unique. Um, you know, they only made one, you know, galvano in order to, to make the dye to make multiple medals. Um, so each of those are unique in their own right. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, that's brilliant. Thanks so much for your time. Yes. Um, it was a really pleasure. good resource. It's and good. Um, good luck with the, with the ongoing projects. I think it'll yes. keep, you, keep you going for a very long time. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank so you very much. I, I'm tempted to say you deserve a medal for what you've done so far. But <laughs> no, that's too too bad of fun. <laughs> Maybe at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, brilliant. So thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Jesse. Bye.